So we have a, we have a very interesting uh, team here today. I'm Brian T. I'm Ken Taylor. I'm one of the granular the tech tech company here in the research park. And we had some uh, last minute shuffling of the team, so we had to bring some pinch hitters here to help us out. So first up is uh, Kyle Rupna. Kyle, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Howard No, I'm in the CQL and Spirit IoT. Uh, we're a, a startup here in, in Enterprise Works. Uh, we came out of uh, six years of research in UIC's uh, Singapore Research Lab, uh, ESC. Um, and we, we work with a lot of machine learning and IoT on the edge. Before we talk about that. Next up is Jason Fisher. Jason, go ahead. Good morning, I am Beth Ladd. I work at Caterpillar in our uh, Cat Digital division, um, specifically in the area of data analytics. Um, I am uh, the privileged to lead our two uh, R&D labs uh, that are predominantly uh, student-filled labs working on a variety of business and technology challenges from time to time. Hi, good morning, I'm Mark Moran. I'm a part of the, the team for John Deere here at Research Park at the John Deere Technology Innovation Center. And we're also a predominantly uh, student-driven uh, group and uh, do a lot of digital innovation. And I'll be happy to hear it. Thanks for coming to the event today. And Karthik Kalamura. Hello, good morning. My name is Karthik Kalamura. I work in Hathaway as a senior enterprise architect working in the enterprise architecture team. I've been part of the big data transformation, uh, machine learning, deep learning. We have some interesting use cases we're working on, and advanced analytics. I'm an active participant in all of those use cases across the company, which goes in research and as well as in architecture. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start it off um, give each panelist an opportunity to talk about IoT in their particular industry and uh, what interested them in IoT in the current environment. Um, there are a couple of use, interesting use cases we are looking at in, uh, from a biotech perspective. Um, one is uh, mainly in the supply chain side of it and the other one is in the R&D side of it. Um, in the, research and uh, clinical operations side, we are already experimenting some, with some of the use cases where we can have uh, variables um, you know, um, assigned to subjects in clinical trials, and then uh, we are trying to monitor. So typically, in the clinical trial space, um, clinical trials are conducted globally, and then uh, the data is uh, you know, consolidated by some organizations called CROs, it's called clinical research organizations. They consolidate the data and send it back to us. So one of the CROs, actually a couple of CROs are offering the service where subjects can wear wearable devices to track metrics, and then we, they consolidate and give it, to, um, give it to us. So what we are trying to do is to, uh, as the, the, the field is evolving, um, we are depending on the CROs to do that so that we can get the data out. So we don't have to deal with security aspects yet. Um, and then on the manufacturing side, we are trying to uh, use IoT. We are evaluating IoT uh, technologies where we can put in the RFIDs in uh, you know, supply chain vehicles, which ship the, which ship the supplies to different, uh, different uh, customers. And is there a way we can uh, track the temperature, uh, because many of the drugs which are used are uh, controlled by humidity. I mean, they have dependencies on humidity temperatures, so we're trying to see is there a way we can improve our efficiencies by uh, reroping the drugs in case if something goes going to happen in the uh, climatic conditions and things like that. So that is the second use case we're looking at. So from our perspective as Inspired IoT, um, really what we're focusing on is as we see the growth in IoT devices that are putting sensors everywhere, um, we're starting to see sort of second generation of these sensor devices coming 
true, we're now, we don't want to simply send data from the end back to some centralized server and, and make decisions there. We actually want to make latency sensitive decisions at the edge. Um, this can be um, predictive maintenance applications, healthcare applications, uh, security and surveillance applications. Um, but these are all cases where um, we no longer are content with sending the data back to the cloud and waiting for that, that latency uh, for, for a decision to come back down and have, and have a response. Uh, and so what we really are, are interested in is these cases where, whether it's due to the focus of, of the deployment or the cost of, of having uh, the bandwidth to get the data to and from the device, or simply the latency that I, I need to respond in a certain number of milliseconds in order to decide whether to open a door or to decide um, you know, how to how to break emergency services into uh, into a, a loop. Um, those are the kinds of systems we build. How do we get the intelligence from the cloud back out to do that trade? Right? So that's what's interesting. So Caterpillar has been doing IoT before it was called IoT. Um, so we certainly have uh, machine telemetry coming off of our machines globally all around the planet. Uh, additionally, as you would expect, we've got a lot of uh, sort of on the line kind of uh, data that's created in all of our manufacturing facilities globally as well, uh, which we make use of, um, in particular for things that involve uh, health and safety, but additionally as well in the areas of productivity and efficiency as well. Um, going forward, I think Caterpillar is trying to um, explore the next generation of, of hardware and software and, and all the interesting intricacies that there are between those two things in a world where um, software updates come out every two weeks instead of where software and hardware updates come out every two years. Uh, and figure out what that means for us, not only in terms of what we've done traditionally um, with our machines or our manufacturing facilities, but also what that means in terms of job site services, job site safety and security, um, whether that's uh, on a construction site, surface mining site, underground mining site, and uh, quarry and gravel. Um, in terms of IoT, it's really productivity that uh, is the name of the game. things that everyone else said. <laughs> so, uh, so in that spirit, uh, how are your comments about things on the edge and kind of moving into that, and, you know, you could maybe say long computing kind of era, I think is really important and what's interesting about IoT right now. You know, fast our companies are going to be in the same markets and we're both kind of OGs when it comes to IoT stuff right away before the, the term. Um, I, I think what I think is really interesting about IoT today is, is just the amount of work you can do at the edge. And, uh, and, and I, I like to think about these things in a longer time window and set some context. So I did some digging. I pulled up the top 500 list from the late 90s, kind of the days of the Auto ID Lab, 500 fastest computers in the world. Um, if you had a teraflop or better, you were in that top. You know, an NVIDIA Jetson TX2 arguably has about a teraflop and a half. That's a $600 supercomputer that you can hold in your hand that 20 years ago might have been the fastest, had a, was a contender for the fastest computer in the world. Uh, it's hard to overstate how much has changed. And the, the amount of work you can do right there on the edge, not, not just for the, the latency or the, or the unavailability of the network, but just the scale of the computing you can do. Um, and that's very different from, I think I would even say two, two years ago, it was a very, very different world in terms of, you know, the intelligence side of the edge. So that's, I think, the thing we're most excited about right now. We've already touched on the edge computing issue. Can we talk about security and how that affects IoT devices and decision making? <laughs> Start, yeah. Um, security is um, that the, the edge computing is that trickier too, right? When, when, every, when everything comes back to one centralized location, be that a corporate data center or the cloud, 
it's a lot easier to secure. Still not, still not simple task, but a much simpler task. Um, how you deal with um, kind of the pervasive data. Um, I agree with you. I think that's a very good concern. And it also slows down innovation and efficiency because if we are depending on third party vendors to you know, consolidate all their data and send it to us, that's one, one of the primary drivers for that is security concerns. Uh, as we open up um, our businesses to external partners, but that still is not a really challenge. Just, Kyle, I want to build on your, I love your point about you know, the processing on the edge gives us an opportunity to put more intelligence and put more defense on the edge. I think at the same time, it also creates more risk. <coughs> There's more horsepower out there, out there on the edge to be controlled and exploited. Uh, so that, I feel like it's a double-edged sword. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, as we, as we have these powerful systems um, and you know, when we're talking about you know, tens of billions of devices, that's a huge attack. You know, that, so we can't, you know, protecting 25 billion devices is a huge challenge. Um, personally, I believe that we're going to need a, a mixture of both um, the best software practices but perhaps custom hardware uh, that is there for the security. Uh, and so it, it helps to reduce the sort of the surface uh, of that, that attack in the And if I think about um, some of the some of the verticals that are represented on the panel, mm -hmm. I think about construction sites, I think about medical environments. Um, those are very what appear to be random processes. And it's harder to enforce order something in, in environments like that, which I think uh, makes the, the risk more real. Uh, I think there's many of us that welcome some legislation, uh, to some extent, some reason for this legislation, just to help out the level of playing field a little bit. Uh, right now, I think uh, how a company perceives the brand, uh, perceives the value of their, their customer, uh, will make you make some longer term decisions that are the right thing to do. Sometimes the market is kind of rewarding those longer time choices. So the level of playing field that might not be a bad thing. It would be better responsibly, basically. I have a question on data. So, uh, uh, as you work with a lot of your customers, as you're saying, there's a lot of opportunity where you can run some of the other on the edge computing on yourself and send the, send the next best action to your customers. But don't you think you need to build a uh, huge infrastructure? to get the data, data compacting systems integrated with, let's say, training data, uh, testing data to, to, to run the mission and other things. So what is the patterns you're seeing in your customer, customer expectations as well as infrastructure design? Well, I think in the case of, of its spirit, we do see that, that the need for hybrid systems. Um, actually, this week we have visited with us our, our partner from Singapore, NCS, um, we've worked together on designing a new smart security and surveillance system. Um, and the, the importance of that system is not that 100% cloud becomes 100% edge. The, the importance is that um, we need to think about the infrastructure and why am I designing 100% cloud when there are things that could and should be happening on the edge. And perhaps I can have a more efficient cloud deployment because I'm only deploying what's necessary for the cloud, cloud. And then I'm also getting a better response time for the subset of machine learning tasks that can and should be having at the edge. And a, you know, an example in our case is detecting particular audio events or particular uh, vision related events that are happening and we need to signal authorities that something is happening with the detection now. But that doesn't take away from the need to archive data, have great have great training data. It doesn't take away the need to archive 30 days of video so that the police can go back and store the record. It just means that we're we're now able to create more value add services where in the past we could have a network of, of very sort of dumb cameras and all of the, the machine learning was, was basically historical. So when I, when I think about a job site, I think about there, there being a, a clear business need for a layered approach. 
right? So we use the word hybrid similarly. There are some data where it is certainly of longer term benefit to collect and analyze um, sometimes real time and additionally sometimes over time. Um, when I think about uh, in particular machine data and its interactions, looking for um, you know, predicted performance of events, those kinds of things, uh, predicted maintenance events, um, predicted catastrophic events, those, those sorts of things. But there are some data that certainly don't have long term value, but that have extremely um, pertinent value on the bench in the moment, looking at productivity on the site, safety on the site. Would I look at that at the time and store it forever? Would I need to analyze that over time? Mm, I don't know. Right? But certainly it could be of high value, um, saving lives and providing efficiencies in media on the job sites and everything in between those, right? So I think we need to think, I think our, I believe our thinking needs to be a little more sophisticated and layered than it's been in the past for data and the services that go along with them are concerned. Where it's, where it's stored, where it's processed, where it's provided, where and when it's kept. And maybe that's a fill on that, but maybe, maybe it's just that some of that data has to come off in the long term. It's not, it's almost yeah. certainly all of it doesn't. And almost mm -hmm. certainly some of it has longer term value. You can, you can solve that on the edge and not bury your network to bring what you need to all of them. Can we open up for questions from the audience? Yes. As the current setup goes, an AR system that has limitations put in place in order to protect the um, possibilities of a data breach, like from any form of a data breach, has been brought to the table before? An AI, I think we heard you say the concept of an AI system to basically to look for, to detect data breaches. Is that yes. what you're asking? To protect any data that's in the system. Because if your issue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Um, so, my original thought as you guys were talking and was thinking about this is creating an AI system that has limitations that are put into place to obviously not allow the AI system to go above and beyond what it's been designed to do because some AIs they are always learning so obviously you would want it to continue to think and find ways to disperse the information on its own. You want it to be in a controlled setting um, which I guess kind of might not really be classified as an AI anymore but I guess where I was going with that is something that would be designed to automatically look for, detect, and prevent any breaches which would allow human innovation to continue without the worry of security being um, leaked out. And I don't know if something like that has been. Sounds magical. <laughs> I want one. <laughs> so, I, I will say I, I'm not aware of any commercial solutions. Um, so um, if you'd like to incorporate, you can get started. Um, but, um, I, I have heard of, of research that would do things like anomaly detection on a stream of network um, operations such that you know, perhaps we can detect that um, suddenly there's a, an unusual amount of activity from an unknown IP address and you, you disable that, that particular connection in order to prevent a data breach because we believe that that anomaly suggests a hack. Um, so that there are things like that that, you know, that we can build from components of known technology. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether there are commercial solutions trying to do that. There, there are some, uh, it, it, I think the question she asked comes into the uh, realm of the cybersecurity, if you will. So there are some commercial companies uh, which actually do that today. Uh, and it goes back to the anomaly detection. So what they do is that uh, you know, they, they put this um, intelligent uh, algorithms, if you will. It keeps on continuously looking at existing data, existing access uh, to the systems, and then it identifies any anomalies of, uh, you know, the system from a different type of address, like a different country or a different geography, which is not, uh, you know, provided access to. So there are such events they generate. However, um, it has to be still, it's still in its evolution phase, I would say, there are some companies. We, as a company, actually, internally, we are using such uh, technologies today. 
uh, there's a company called Splunk, uh, which actually it might, it takes all of the uh, machine data from all the systems and provides the ability to uh, you know, provide you know, anomalies. And then we also do predictive, I mean, we are trying to look, look and uh, evaluate machine learning, deep learning technologies, to do predictive analytics for machine, machine maintenance, uh, you know, equipment maintenance and manufacturing sites, and things like that. But from a, there is a cybersecurity part of it, but there is a normal detection within the company itself. The, the technology is there, but it's still evolving. I think that uh, maybe one of the risks here, uh, there's things that we know about, there's things we can plan for, but I think part of what makes IoT systems trickier related to your really good, really rich, really deep question that left us all flat footed for a few seconds. Uh, it, you know, it's when, when a new threat emerges, when a new vector emerges, updating that fleet can be really tricky. Updating those billions of devices, uh, that's, that's what the hard part is. So, so planning for the things that we know or even detecting that something unusual is going on is hard but often doable. Responding to it can be the really tricky part. Is what if what if to really shut off that new vector? You need to code up across thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of devices. That's hard on the web, but we've gotten pretty good at doing it. It's right now really, really hard. The internet, not the internet of people, but the internet of things. There's a lot of growth to do there. Great question. Any other questions? We'd like an easy one next, please. <laughs> Uh, Next you, question. Uh, have you considered, uh, I mean, blockchain has been around for, for a while now. Have you considered it in your uh, security for your connected devices and your company? I'll go first. Yeah, I'm guessing the answer is the same for all of us. Uh, blockchain and, and you know, the, the underlying distributed ledger has a bunch of a bunch of promise um, for us sorting out, uh, getting under the hype cycle and figuring out how we really apply it uh, is it, still a, a process. Um, it clearly has a role. I wouldn't say we've cracked what it is yet. I, 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 the idea of an open and distributed and transparent ledger is really attractive and maybe a little bit terrifying too. Um, so we haven't totally solved that. And, and I think you know, if we want to talk about kind of next generation technologies, although you could argue blockchain is a this generation technology, uh, when we think about uh, security and threats, if, if when we get to the point where we can do quantum computing at scale, well, that just throws everything we think we know about security away. And being ready for that one, I don't, I'm not sure none of us are there yet. Uh, that's another uh, something on the horizon that we have to address. Mm -hmm. Get one answer on that question. Okay, I'd like to ask how you ensure that your talent, that would include data scientists, engineers, etc., understand accurately all the data that you are dealing with. Especially, this also applies more especially when there is a lot of student talent who may not have the domain expertise and a follow-up would be, can you think of a case where misunderstanding the data led to the bad consequences? So, I'll speak from the student perspective since um, that's a, a big part of what I do every day. I think one of the most important things that you can do for students is to pair them up um, with someone who has domain expertise or subject matter expertise. It's absolutely critical. Um, talent, um, particular domain uh, in terms of technical expertise is not enough. In my opinion, it's less than half of the equation. Um, the, the vast majority of what's necessary is understanding the data itself. And that's just not just what's in column Q, but it's also where did it come from? How timely is it? How clean is it? Uh, what, can we, what can we reasonably expect from it? Have we interrogated that data to uh, efficiently and, and effectively enough to be able to really speak to what you can and can't do with it? Uh, because ultimately, no matter if you profile the data and you've chosen algorithm 11 and you 
think that that's the one to apply, you don't have that understanding, you don't have that foundation, then you should be suspicious of whatever comes out on the other side of the equal sign. Uh, so I think it's incredibly important um, that we don't undervalue subject matter expertise and domain knowledge um, as a partner to technical expertise. And, and, and I would add to that that it's, it's not just a problem of the domain experience of expertise, which is a huge problem in and of itself. Um, but in a world where data science is viewed among, you know, among our entry-level engineers as they're taken to riches, we have an enormous amount of people who want to claim that they are data science uh, experts. Um, and there's a big difference between somebody who understands what's happening in, in machine learning techniques and understands what it means to design a, a decision tree or, or to use certain types of convolution and activation, uh, activation functions. And somebody who, uh, for, for lack of a, a better description, they're programming through simulated imagery. They, they download something from, from the web and they iteratively make small changes to parameters and how it appears to work. Um, and that sort of approach um, is, is also a huge problem um, because I believe that you need an understanding of what the data science techniques are actually doing in order to leverage the domain, domain expertise that hopefully you, you have uh, sitting around you. Okay, I, love, I love your point about you know, we need more qualified data scientists, like 100, 500 percent of your Chad, I love your question. But one thing I've wondered, and I think my big part of the solution is, is data science needs to borrow something from the developer world and try kind of a data science with a pair programming um, and, and get that domain expert uh, with, with the data scientists and have them together. And you know the kind of productivity. I think there's an opportunity there. I don't know quite what it looks like. But your, your question is, is great. Is that, you know, the cloud made it worse because we had access to data that we didn't really know the provenance for. And now IoT makes it worse even again. Because you just don't um, really think most companies have struggled to have the rigor across time to really know the full history of their data. And so we can make really dangerous assumptions about that. Abby's standpoint, we already have students pair up with some of the projects. Uh, so what uh, in terms of especially GPU-based uh, processing and uh, machine learning and NLP, these are the areas we already have students working with us. But uh, given the fact that they don't have the domain expertise, this failing, not only failing, but they need to actively get engaged in projects. Um, and I also want to add that data curation uh, and data quality is a big challenge any, any for, for the, any of the machine learning projects because the, the types of data sources we have today to solve a particular problem uh, is there are a lot of other data sources and each of those data sources come with their own challenges. So we need to basically start from the scratch in terms of what are we solving, how are we solving, and what is the data sources we need to have. How do we curate it? How do we enrich it to make it really useful for any analytics? So that's a good challenge. So I think it would take a combination of uh, paying students with uh, you know companies like um, companies who are working in a specific domain, as well as domain experts who want to go through students who have certainly had this uh, data. I think for us, it's not always enough. I agree with that. But sometimes uh, when you have if we're working in, say, manufacturing data, uh, you know, the origin of the data set can be decades old, and, uh, and the, the expertise may be long retired. So sometimes it's, it's not just about pairing up the data science skills with, uh, with the domain expertise. It's, it's um, an inherent skepticism about your data and, and, and being overly intentional not to Mis misuse it, and repurpose it, assume things that it might be true. That's where you get back to the science of data science. You know, you know, you know, 
grounding yourself on the first principles and being skeptical and really having a rigor about your process on top of what all the things that I think so. I like, I like to use the word intentionality, and I think that's the most important thing that we can do. Uh, we, we need to go back to the scientific method. We need to start yep. right at the beginning with a hypothesis and test that and be honest with ourselves and intentional throughout that process, um, especially where we're mixing old data sources with new data sources. Right? And, and somehow, right, the key, the trick is to balance that with the speed of expectation of our partners, customers, uh, and corporations. One, one thing I want to say before we go to the panel, we talked about some last minute changes. I want you all to talk to Beth back call after six last night. He said, hey, uh, we, we've got a spot. You can pitch it. And Masha from India called her. And that's the kind of collaboration we have in the park. She's got to do it absolutely last minute. Very gracious. <laughs> Thank you, dear, and Kat, for sitting next to each other, proving we can work together. <laughs> Thank you for the uh, question. Um, my question is uh, just to focus on the security problem I have the IoT system, such as uh, if I ride a um, driverless uh, car, my first problem is uh, I, I'm worried about someone hack my IoT system and the cloud system. So my question is, do we have some solution to protect our IoT system and the cloud? There's all kinds of solutions to protect them. It's, it's the thing, it's like all security problems. It's the thing that you didn't know was coming. That's, that's the real risk. Uh, there's a paper out from uh, Stevens Institute of Technology in the last year looking at how, in the last couple years, um, at how the, the car insurance industry is going to change. And uh, you can expect that you're going to have, it's likely in the next few years you'll start paying a uh, you know, line item for cybersecurity on your car insurance. Uh, <laughs> as, a, as a new revenue opportunity, as honestly there will be fewer accidents in the autonomous world we drive better on balance. Uh, but the market's going to change. And my, my first reaction to your question is part of the protection will be the role of insurance. OK, thank you. Yeah, I think stepping out of the, uh, out of the box and thinking differently, Target did not expect that the hack would occur in their point of sale devices rather than an attack on the security of their mainframe. And so they weren't thinking about the point of sale terminal where you swipe your card as an IoT device that had, you know, essentially flawed security. So we need to think about everything in the chain of our devices. Any other questions? Lean in the back. expectations when it comes to data updates or data corrections. So if there's an error in how an IoT device is recording data and we have to go through and re-update all that old data, how do we manage those stakeholder expectations? Um, without uh, the appropriate level of due diligence and thought 
for an IoT device that's on a machine has a much larger impact and much larger potential for risk. Um, so I think we all, again, there's, there's a deliberate um, thought that needs to be there as we think, as we balance what's the risk with updating these edge devices, um, balanced with the business need, obviously, and the, and the, and the request for being fast. That's a great question, Keegan. One thing that comes to mind is uh, when, when we do agile practices well, uh, that customer engagement should come along. Uh, that's, that's one part of it. I think Beth, I really agree with your, your idea of kind of what's the right risk <coughs> profile and the right velocity that comes along with it. So, so the, the, uh, the, clock side, the clock speed you might expect on a piece of big iron is, is very different clock speed that you might expect on a, you know, a, on a website, but that same principle of involving your customers all the way through the process, um, and then you know, putting it on that kind of that product owner role to communicate back to their community, um, I think that helps. Getting it right the first time also helps. Right. I mean, ultimately, I think what you're asking is, how do I make my customers trust me? Uh, and in, in the modern world, we're seeing that part of that trust is, is a transition to transparency um, and, and a transition to allowing your customers to understand the processes that you're following and, and delivering them updates, understanding your decision making and, and what you're delivering to them. And you know, certainly that doesn't mean that, that every update is going to fix 100% bugs. I mean, there's always more bugs. There's always something more to do, but building the trust with your customers helps them understand that you're following the process and you're moving in the right direction. Um, and you know that kind of, of relationship helps them understand that they're not screaming into the wind when something doesn't work right. Could we touch on um, uh, personal IoT, wearables, uh, internet assistance, home automation? In that respect. Sure. Uh, uh, Put your microphone by your mouth. You don't want it. Oh. So if you, uh, I think even the variables uh, are, uh, you know, it's an evolutionary phase. Uh, you, you take a Fitbit or any of those, the majority of the, uh, you know, all of those devices sync up data at the top. Now, uh, they, I'm sure there are updates even, even, in, uh, uh, even in those devices as well. But when it comes to IoT devices, 